I've discovered something insane. From 400 rating, all the way up to 2000, the only opening where black actually has a higher win rate than white, is the Karokan defense. And after days of digging deep, I think I've figured out why. But to understand the answer, we have to travel back to the 19th century, during what's known as the Romantic Era of Chess, an era marked by bold and audacious moves, brutal sacrifices and aggressive openings like these. Players like the American prodigy Paul Morphy dominated with their wild tactical genius. Then came William Steinitz, the youngest of Taylor Joseph Steinitz's 13 sons. He learned to play chess at age 12, and later moved to the United States, but he couldn't keep up with the tactical chaos. So he took a completely different approach. Steinitz played positionally, favoring quiet openings over aggressive gambits. Instead of throwing pieces away for a flashy attack, he focused on pawn structure, kept all his material intact, and won easily in the endgames. His calm methodical style is identical to the philosophy of the Karokan defense, and his dominance was so overwhelming, it's said to have put an end to the Romantic era of chess. But why am I telling you about these ancient players? Because I believe the Romantic era is still alive today. It lives on in the style and attitude of players rated below 2000. Chaos reigns on the board. Gambits are everywhere. But here's the catch, they all seem to lose to the Karokan defense. Some patterns are just too strange to ignore. So in this video, we're going to study three example games that show how this reserved opening seems to triumph over uncontrolled aggression. And in true old school fashion, our first game will pit two chess legends against each other. Two legends who in terms of chess style, couldn't be more different. Tal, with the white pieces, played e4, an opening that aligns well with his daring attacking style and tactical brilliance. He was known as the magician of Riga for a reason. But on the black pieces was Mikhail Batvinyak, the most principled of chess players, methodical, the kind of guy that checks his stool three times a week, to make sure all is in order. He believed preparation beats intuition, patience beats creativity, and with the calm reply of C6, in game 18 of the World Championship match of 1961, a clash of two opposites was well underway in Moscow. D4 by Tal was met with D5, challenging the center. And if you're an aggressive player with the white pieces, E5 is the move for you. It gains kingside space and sets the stage for a ferocious attack. But the Karo Khan is a solid defense, and the idea is to build a solid triangular pawn structure that will hold steady against any attack white throws at you. But before Batvinyak does that, he plays bishop f5 so his light squared bishop isn't stuck inside the pyramid. That is solid Karo Khan principle. But Tal wasn't going to let Batvinyak dictate the pace of the game. He played h4, launching a quick kingside pawn storm. Why? If you watched part 3 of my previous video about pawn storms, you know why. But this wildly aggressive move comes with a hidden threat. If black blindly continues with his plan of e6, he will lose his light squared bishop. If you want to figure out how, pause the video, now. The idea is g4, hitting the bishop, and after bishop e4, f3 by white means the only safe square is g6. But after h5, you'd be surprised by the number of Karo Khan players that fall into this trap every single day. The move h4 has proven to be so effective it is now known as the tall variation of the Karo Khan defense. But Batvinyak wasn't going to fall for it on this day. He played h6, creating a safe square for his bishop on h7. But after g4, he gets second thoughts and plays bishop d7. I'm guessing he was worried about the move e6. Batvinyak is not going to ruin his pawn structure, even if you offered him a free pawn for it. He was that type of player. And after c3 and c5, on move 7 of the game, we see the first white piece move. Wild. Tal was that type of player. But Vinyak defends his pawn with the move e6, but that leaves him with a bit of an issue. This is a bad bishop, that's a bishop with limited movement because it is in the same color complex as your pawn chain. So after knight e2, but Vinyak pushes to exchange his bad bishop for Tal's knight. We are witnessing world champion level positional understanding at play. But Tal's aggressive style comes with the belief that bishops will always be better than knights, so he welcomes the exchange. In fact, he helps it happen with the move knight a3. So, takes takes, and after takes takes, the question is, would Batvinyak give up yet another bishop for a knight, just so he can ruin white's pawn structure? The answer is yes. Takes takes, and this is the position on the board. White has the bishop pair advantage, but he has terrible pawns, these are doubled pawns, this is a backward pawn weakness, and it can be argued that these are overextended. So, will Tal use his bishop pair to launch a devastating attack, or will he lose slowly in a quiet endgame? Knight c6. 
Black immediately attacks White's pawn weakness. Bishop e3 protects, and Queen a5 check eyes another one of White's multiple pawn weaknesses. But he is not in a hurry to capture it. This is the opening, and Budvinyak is developing his pieces. I personally would be all over that pawn, but Budvinyak is as principled as they come. Tal plays rook b1, attacking Black's pawn, but instead of going for complications, Budvinyak calmly plays rook b8, protecting his b7 pawn. Chaos is the last thing you want as a Karo Khan player, especially if your opponent is Mikhail Tal. Bishop h3 is played, creating a square for the king to occupy and be in some form of pseudo-castled position. Here, you would think the next move for a principled player like Budvinyak is to castle and ensure his king's safety, but in some positions, the king might be safer in the center than on the king side. This is one of those positions. Because as soon as Budvinyak castles, the pawns, the rooks, the bishops, and the queen will descend mercilessly upon Black's king. Tal is praying for the move castles, and Budvinyak knows it. So he continues to tickle Tal's weak spots by playing queen a4, attacking the d4 pawn. After rook d1, protecting, Black captures on a3, and he is now a pawn up, which to Budvinyak is enough of an advantage to take to the endgame. So after king g2, Budvinyak plays queen a6, asking for a queen trade, and Tal obliges takes takes, and Tal advances his kingside pawns. The attacking idea remains the same, so Budvinyak intelligently places his king on d7, an endgame principle. If the queens are off the board, and there is no risk of getting mated, the king is much better placed in the center than in the corner. Because in an endgame, the time your king takes to get in on the action, will likely be the difference between a win, draw, or a loss. Sometimes it comes down to one move. You would know that, if any of your games ever made it to the endgame. But the theme of all-out attack, reigns supreme in 1000 rated chess games. And I guess I made this Karo Khan video, to prove to you that if you defended your king, like how you defend Donald Trump, you would be well above 2000 elo at this point. Anyway, white plays rook b1, challenging black's control of the b-file. But if Tal wants to trade rooks, thank you for fixing my doubled pawns. Tal, who I bet is fuming at Bitvinyak's attention to minor details, and conservative style in general, advances his king to aid these pawns in the attack. But Vinyak, on the other hand, is in pure positional mode. He notices that his two knights are somewhat superfluous. What does that word mean? Comment below if you've been studying a lot of chess, and I will pin it for everyone to see. Anyway, but Vinyak identifies the square c4, as a beautiful outpost for the knight and plays knight a5. White responds by exchanging rooks, fixing black's pawns in the process, and then playing f4. This is not the middle game position Tal had in mind coming into this world championship game. And knight c4 is how Budvinyak shows us the superiority of the knight over the bishop in these static positions. Bishop c1 is played, and knight c6 attacks white's pawn on c4. How would you defend it? There is only one logical move. The rook is now stuck protecting the c4 weakness. And here is a quick positional trick to use in your games, if you ever have a 3 point piece holding down a 5 point piece in a standoff, you are essentially 2 points of material ahead of your opponent, and you should be looking to use your temporary material superiority to your advantage. I personally would be pushing these pawns forward, looking to create an extra problem for white to deal with, but Bitvinia cops for knight before, luring this pawn to capture. a3 places the pawn under the protection of the bishop, but knight a2 seeks to trade that bishop immediately. f5, takes takes, but black has to be careful here. This is not a free pawn. That's because knight takes a3 will be met by rook a1, knight c4, and all of a sudden, white's rook infiltrates and gets ready to cause all sorts of problems on these two ranks. That's how easily a win can slip away in a game of chess. But Budvinyak is not the type to succumb to greed. He simply played b5, and this, is a dream position for every Karo Khan player. The game is not decided by a huge explosive attack but by a cold and calm exploitation of all your opponent's minute mistakes. Tal plays rook a1, protecting his pawn, but do you remember the positional trick I told you about? It is in Budvinyak's interest to keep this knight and rook standoff, and he does just that. King e7 shifts focus to the king side, where this measly bishop is set to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this monster of a piece. Why does the Karo Khan have the highest win rate, you ask? Imagine unleashing this level of detail-oriented psychopathy on your fellow 1200s. You are going straight to hell. King f4 is followed by rook c8, after which g5 initiates a series of captures. Rook c6 is played by Bitvinyak, daring any piece to enter the 6th rank. King back to f4, Tal at this point, is fuming on the inside. And after rook h6 and bishop g4, 
protecting the h5 pawn, but Vignic won't make the mistake of tying down his 5-point rook to a 3-point bishop. He opts out of the pawn debate, but his destination square means that white can now free his rook. Rook c1, and this pawn cannot be captured, the rook would be hanging. So, after 40 moves of solid and principled chess, but Vignic decides to play for a trick, f6. And an already frustrated tall falls for it. Pawn takes pawn, pawn takes, and then knight takes e5, is a huge blow to white. Surprisingly, neither of these two pieces are hanging. The rook is protected by the knight, and the knight cannot be captured, because this rook is hanging. Black is two clean pawns ahead in an endgame, at GM level, this is game over. Tal plays a few more moves and then puts an end to his misery. He resigned, and in the following days went on to lose the world championship title to Batvinyak. A brilliant portrayal of the strength of the Karo Khan defense at the elite level. But how does the Karo Khan fare at lower levels? E4 C6, and F4 is on the board. This 2100 rated Leeches player has turned to aggression as early as move 2, but in pure Karo Khan spirit, his opponent, who I hope is doing okay wherever he is, replies with d5, an instant strike at the center. e5 is played by white, bypassing the central conflict and marching his pawn straight toward black's king. The Karo Khan defense is in for a tough test in this game, but after knight h6, it seems it is in the hands of an expert. Every time there is a pawn on f4, or something shielding the view of this dark squared bishop, this route, becomes an option for developing the knight. Knight f3 is met by bishop g4, moving the bishop out in preparation for e6, which, after the weird move d3, is played completing the triangle of pawns. This is the strongest shape in nature. There's a reason why the pyramids are still standing today. It's basic high school physics, I could teach you, but I don't want to alienate my fellow South African viewers. They ain't here for none of that. Anyway, White plays a move on the queen side because Black's grip on these two squares has put his kingside dreams to a complete halt. After knight f5 and bishop e2, queen b6 is played by Black, eyeing all the dark squares in White's camp. Simple development, and a solid pawn structure, Black is putting on a Karo Khan masterclass. After the move d4, the engine gives a minus 1.3 advantage for Black. It's gone through thousands of variations and moves into the future to come up with that evaluation, but as a human being, how can you evaluate which side is better in a particular chess position? Well, you have something that the computer doesn't, feel. Or should I say, intuition. In this position, everything seems equal except for these two pieces. This is white's bad bishop. It has virtually no movement because it's stuck in the same color complex as its pawns. This is black's bad bishop, but the difference is that it's outside the pawn chain and is of more use than its white counterpart. By virtue of that, with just one glance at the position, you can feel that black is better without calculating numerous lines. What's the average lifespan of a stand-up comedian in North Korea? I don't know, but I have a feeling about it. That's that high-level intuition. The human brain is awesome. And so is the move c5 in this position. It seeks to undermine white's pawn structure but also sets up a sneaky trap. And white falls for it. All black has to do is eliminate this defender, and this pawn is up for grabs. A series of captures occurs, after which bishop takes f3, leaves white's pawn undefended. But white still has to be careful here, it's easy to go from a bad position to totally lost in just one move. Bishop d1 is correct, black develops his bishop, and after knight c3 and castles, he is a clear pawn up, with more developed pieces and an active rook. White can feel the game slipping away, so he decides to lash out with g4, hoping to create some kingside chaos and rely on his bishop pair to prove superior to black's knights. But knight c6 leaves white with a difficult question. Where to put the king? Castling deflects this rook and defeats the purpose of the pawn storm. Also, it loses immediately to knight c2. A discovered check that will capture a free rook on the next move. So, after some thought, white awkwardly plays king d2, and it's met instantly with the thrust b5. The engine recommends h4 for white, boldly sticking to his original plan, but white chickens out and plays a3, thinking it stops the b4 pawn advance. It doesn't. Capturing before loses on the spot, a painful realization. White plays knight a4, hitting the bishop, which retreats to e7. In the next few moves, white achieves absolutely nothing, and worsens his position by playing b3, because after b5, the only retreating square for the knight, cuts off the protection of this pawn. Black takes, and after the knight retreats to d3, black plays b4. He is now two pawns up. But these aren't just normal pawns, 
they're protected past pawns. This is an advanced protected past pawn, the ultimate form of a pawn. Its power is over 9000. White blockades it with rook a2, but if you remember the trick I told you about earlier, this is a 5 point piece tied down to a 1 point pawn. No bueno. But it's even worse because knight a5 leaves white helpless to protect the pawn. So takes 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 and now the bishop is under fire. It flees to e3, and we should take a moment to appreciate the effectiveness of the Karo Khan style of play. No wild attacks on the king, no fancy sacrifices, just a calm dismantling of your opponent's ego, one move at a time. A quick win is always nice, but sometimes, you just want to take your time, and watch as your opponent slowly descends into hopelessness, move by move. I'm a good person, I swear. Anyway, rook c6 is played, and in the following moves, black converts the position by trading pieces and advancing his pawns. That didn't stop white from setting one final trap though. Rook c1 leaves the knight undefended, and black falls for it. Except, the bishop simply retreats to f8, in case of any back rank shenanigans. Those two seconds of hope are what kill you on the inside. White resigns, just in time for us to come full circle and find out what happens when 1000 rated players go toe to toe in Karo Khan defense waters. E4 by Steven, a strong leeches player, who it seems, had a rough day at the office yesterday, faces the Karo Khan defense, at the hands of a player named Michael, who, I'm assuming, was born on December 5, 1995. Take good care of your passwords sir. Anyway, white expands with d4, and black replies with d5, asking a question of white's center. White goes for the advance variation, and after bishop f5 c3 and e6, are we about to witness flawless Karo Khan play at 1000 rating? No. Unfortunately, calm and patient is not the way of the 1000s. c5 is played, and after the bishops are exchanged, black's pawn structure is in mild disarray. But white plays b3. I think the idea is to go bishop a3, and then capture on c5, a terrible plan. You don't want to spend two moves to make a threat, that can be parried by one move. These are the kinds of small mistakes that accumulate into a bad position. But black replies in kind, playing knight e7, a blunder. It leaves the c5 pawn hanging, but somehow, this blunder is the best move in the position. If white takes c5, not only does he ruin his beautiful pawn formation, but he also won't keep the extra pawn after a move like knight c6. Knight e7 is a 2500 level move. These 1000s are out of control. White develops a knight preparing to castle, and black plays yet another engine recommended move. But after bishop e3, the move f6, brings us back to 1000 elo land. I wouldn't be looking to open the center, if I had an uncastled king like this one, that's how you get mated on move 9. But takes takes is met by castling, and after bishop d6, it looks like black's king will be safe after all, but at the expense of a pawn. A pawn which white doesn't capture, due to circumstances beyond his control. Black takes the chance to trade it. And surely now, he will castle and bring his king to safety. No. Bishop c7 first, because, at 1000 lo, the queen belongs on d6, aiming at the h2 square, drooling, waiting for the knight to move. White sees through this plan and plays g3, defending against a threat, that hasn't even been made yet. So black castles and goes back to the drawing board. But why am I analyzing such a terrible game, you ask? The truth is, the Karo Khan is not an easy opening to master. Don't be fooled by how easy the previous Karo Khan players made it look. Most of your games will be as chaotic as this one, if not more, and that's okay. I feel it's better to learn a solid opening on which you can track your long-term progress, than to give in to the chaos, and play your Latvian or chimpanzee gambits, which you will abandon as soon as you hit 1500. Let me know what you think. Anyway, after all that speculation, white finally reveals the brilliant idea behind g3. Knight h4 offers a trade of knights, takes takes and instead of capturing the pawn with the queen, which I think would have worked marvelously, black makes his intentions obvious by playing queen d6. Even my little brother with the IQ of a dead baboon, can see these two pieces are up to no good. f4 is played instantly, but black has one more trick left in the tank. h6, knight d2 and g5, enticing white with a free pawn. Takes takes and takes, is the kind of happiness only a dirty chess player is familiar with. Queen takes h2, brings us to the end of my attempt to introduce you to a different style of play. If you find it interesting, this, is where you can start your Karo Khan journey. You can also join my Patreon, where I will be posting my Karo Khan speedrun early next week. 
take care of your pets, and see you on the other side.